It's been said that the best way to get a person interested in a topic is by telling a moving personal story. So here it goes. Way back in 2011, a 13-year-old Adam was just starting to get interested in films. But back then, and considering it was rural Sussex, internet speeds moved about as fast as the Brexit process. There was only one real place to turn to. Sure, you could go to the library, but their selection wasn't great, and let's just say the old ladies in there frowned upon me trying to rent certain films. In the UK, we had a company called Love Film. Similar to how Netflix started, you could go online and rent a movie, and they would deliver it right through your letterbox. One of the big blockbusters of that year was Battle Los Angeles, so using my brother's Love Film account, I eagerly put in my order for the DVD and awaited its arrival. One day I got home from school and finally the DVD fairy had been and dropped off my copy of what I was pretty sure was going to be a kick-ass film. I put it in and started watching it. About halfway through, I realised something was up. This film definitely didn't have a Hollywood budget and I was starting to think to myself, I'm sure that's not Michelle Rodriguez. And Wait, is that the Millennium Falcon? I had been duped tricked, con. I looked at the DVD cover and realised I wasn't watching Battle Los Angeles at all, but in actual fact, Battle of Los Angeles, which in fairness is a better name. One had Aaron Eckhart, while the other had Kel Mitchell. One had a budget of $70 million, while the other looks like it was made on Windows Movie Maker and a flip cam. Finally, one was made by Columbia Pictures and the other was made by a company called The Asylum. I couldn't believe it. Could it have just been a coincidence that these films had really similar titles and plots? After all, White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen were released just two months apart. And to prove no one can tell the difference, these posters are the wrong way round and I bet you didn't even notice. I did some research into the asylum to see what else they had made. When I saw their filmography, I was genuinely shocked. Here's just a few of my favourite titles from them. Triassic World Tomb Invader Planet of the Sharks Independence's Day, Almighty Thor, Sunday School Musical, Snakes on a Train, and my personal favourite, Transmorphers. As you can probably see, the studio specialises in what have been dubbed mockbusters. These are low budget, quickly made films that are released to coincide with the release of a bigger blockbuster film. The idea is that the mockbuster will be able to use the marketing of the bigger blockbuster without spending any of the money. According to the two men named David who run the asylum, they stumbled across mockbusters by mistake. They just so happened to release their adaptation of War of the Worlds at the same time Steven Spielberg did. You know, great minds think alike. Anyway, Blockbuster ended up ordering 100,000 copies of the Asylum version, and the Davids realised they were onto a winner. You're probably thinking, surely they can't make any money? Well, they point to a report from Blockbuster and Hollywood Video that says only 1% of people ask for their money back for these films. And according to them, they haven't lost any money on any of their productions since 2009. This makes them more successful than both of those two film stores, Twitter, and basically any business that has the word Trump in the title. The Asylum are far from the only company to make these kinds of films, and their history actually dates back all the way to the 1930s. A decade pretty terrible for most people with the Great Depression, the start of World War II and the Hindenburg disaster, but not all that bad for the Scottish with the birth of Sean Connery, the first modern sighting of the Loch Ness Monster, and the founding of the Scottish National Party, whose objective back then was to secede from the United Kingdom. O awkward. But in these trying times, people turned to entertainment. Given it was the Great Depression, people didn't really have a lot of money, so cinemas started introducing what Tracy Beaker would call Bog Off. Bog Off, or Buy One Get One Free, more commonly known as the double feature, but I just really wanted to use a Tracy Beaker clip. The first, or A, picture would be the one that people were really interested to see, and then the theatres would buy a cheaper B film just to pad out the schedule. The big studios got in on it, and by 1935, B-movie production made up about half of Warner Brothers' output. The mass production of TV did lead to a decline in these films. People could watch bad films at home, so they only went to cinemas for the big spectacle films. They survived until the 90s, however, mainly targeting big-name directors who they knew would make successful films. Most Spielberg films from the time were followed by a copycat. They weren't great. Just look at this clip from the E.T. knockoff, Mac and Me. thinking, how do they get away with this? Fan-made films get taken down all the time, but several companies thrive off this business model. 
Well, it all comes down to towing a very fine line between similarity and copying. Good Times Pictures, another studio that specialised in mockbuster animated films, were taken to court by Disney over their straight-to-video Aladdin movie that came out just a few months before the real thing. Eventually, the court actually decided in favour of Good Times because Aladdin is a public domain character and the films were found to have enough differences to make them distinguishable. Basically, because the genie was gold and had a moustache. The Asylum did once lose a lawsuit against Warner Brothers for its film Age of the Hobbits. They unsuccessfully argued that Hobbit was a generic term and were ordered to change the film's name to Clash of the Empires. Now, we already know that the video and DVD rental market revitalised this industry, but even online streaming services have fallen into the trap. In what was presumably an attempt by Netflix to pad out their library in the early days, they licensed films like Tappy Toes, Little Cars and Chop Kick Panda, leading to some pretty confused customers. Despite the success they've seen in the mockbuster market, it's worth noting that since 2013 the Asylum has also had success in making original films, like the infamous Sharknado franchise. So although I might not have got the film I wanted, and honestly looking back it wasn't actually that much worse than the real thing, I did learn about a whole sub-industry within film. So all that's left to say is thanks to the Davids. You're really one of a kind. Wait. If you enjoyed that video, why don't you check out one of these other videos, or you can even subscribe to the channel and you'll see more from me in the future. If there's any topic that you want me to do a video on, uh, leave it down in the comments and I'll do a bit of research. Thanks for watching.